Good morning. I hope everyone is well. My name is uh, Teji Singh. I'm one of the many people who have been the, who have the pleasure of working on Nushan's mustard dystrophy uh, research projects here at Sarepta. At Sarepta, my role is the global development lead for our microdystrophin gene therapy program. Thank you to uh, PPMD for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today, and to all of you for viewing this pre-recorded presentation. Before going further, I'd like to emphasize that microdystrophin gene therapy is investigational has not been FDA reviewed or approved by any regulatory agencies to date. At Sarepta, we're conducting studies on this approach and no conclusions have been reached regarding the safety or efficacy of the microdystrophin gene therapy. The presentation today is intended to show only the preliminary clinical data of microdystrophin gene therapy, which was published by Dr. Mendel and his group June 15th in JAMA Neurology. We recognize that much work still needs to be done And before we start, uh, I want to take a moment for everyone here to view the, our forward-looking statements. Today, I'll be speaking about our future goals and plans regarding therapy for DMD. And we'd like to note that, these are, that there is risk that uncertainty is associated with speaking about future events. One conflict that I have is that I'm a paid employee of Sarepta, where our goal is to develop life-changing precision genetic medicines to treat 100% of individuals with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Our experience in DMD and the breadth of our pipeline is unparalleled. Our pipeline includes three distinct approaches to, uh, to the address the underlying cause of Duchenne's. These modalities include RNA therapies with their PPMO and PMO platforms, gene therapy, and also gene editing. In total, we have 20 Duchenne programs in our pipeline and more than 10 years of work in Duchenne's research development to help achieve our goal of one day being able to treat 100% of individuals with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. In addition to our clinical experience, we continue to advance our science with our Gene Therapy Center of Excellence under the leadership of Dr. Louise Rodino Claypack and with external collaborations. For example, in work on next generation vector design, we work with companies like Stride Bio and Dino. To support our programs, we're also investing in manufacturing with the goal of building the largest gene therapy manufacturing ca uh, capacity in the industry. We're using a hybrid model with investments in both internal expertise and establishment of flexible working relationships with strategic partners. To prepare for challenges of access and reimbursement, we're also collaborating with regulators, policymakers, payers, and academic thought leaders on an ongoing basis. And we know that leadership in gene therapy is multifaceted and is only possible with strong collaborations between groups, both internally and externally. This slide highlights some of the collaborations that we have. We won't have time today to cover all aspects of gene therapy. So if you'd like to learn more, please download our educational brochure, Gene Therapy and Duchenne's. You will find an overview of our goals with answers to frequently asked questions. Now let's discuss our microdystrophin gene therapy program. Again, microdystrophin is investigational and it has not been reviewed or approved by the FDA or any regulatory authority. When we talk about gene therapy, we're talking about inserting or transplanting a custom designed gene into a target cell like the muscle in place of a missing or de defective gene in order to correct an underlying genetic disorder and having that gene produce a protein of interest. To do this, there are three main components of a gene therapy drug. These are the vector, the promoter, the transgene. Each part plays a critical role in gene therapy. First, the vector or capsid. The vector is like the delivery agent or like a delivery van for the gene therapy and its internal components. It delivers the package, which is the promoter and the transgene to target cells and helps to get them into the cell itself. Ideally, the vector does this with a minimal immune response so it can get to as many cells as possible. Secondly, second, the promoter. The promoter drives expression of the transgene in the intended cells or the tissue of interest. For example, the muscles. The promoter turns on the transgene and ideally only in the target cell of interest. Since the vector might deliver the transgene to cells other than the cells of interest, 
We just want to make sure that the transgene is turned on in the right types of cells. So a good promoter is very specific to turn on the transgene in these correct cells, which leads to the production of the protein that the gene therapy has been designed to make. And it does this by using the cell's own internal protein manufacturing machinery. Third, the transgene. The transgene is genetic material, the DNA, the instructions, the code, or the blueprint that's needed to produce a functioning version of the protein itself. The transgene only works if the instructions are followed by that cell, again, which is part of the job of the promoter. All this is packaged together into what we call the gene therapy. In the case of our microdystrophin gene therapy, SRP9001, the vector we use is AAVRH74. AAV stands for adeno-associated virus, which is the most common type of vector that has been studied across many gene therapy programs covering many different diseases. RH stands for rhesus monkey, the type of AAV we use, and 74 refers to the specific stereotype of the vector. This specific vector was chosen since it targets skeletal and cardiac muscles the promoter we use is MHCK7. MH stands for myosin heavy chain, and CK stands for creatinine kinase. This promoter, uh, this promoter is muscle specific, so it turns on the transgene in skeletal and cardiac muscles, and less so in other tissues. The transgene itself is the microdystrophin. The reason we call it a microdystrophin is that the instructions for a full length dystrophin are too long or too big to be placed into an AAB capsid. Due to these size constraints, we had to design a shorter or smaller version of a functional dystrophin that we can fit into the package to deliver to the muscle cells. So that means we need to make decisions of what parts of a full length dystrophin we need to keep and what we do not have to have. In this slide on the left is the, what a normal dystrophin contains. Luckily for us, there's experiments in nature or there's people in nature that have a natural shorter dystrophin due to their genetic mutations. And some of these patients have actually done very well clinically. These patients have a dystrophin mutation with what we call a mild phenotype. Specifically, the middle figure in this slide shows the schematic of a dystrophin of a 61-year-old male Becker's patient that produces, due to his genetic condition, this type of a dystrophin. This patient has done very well clinical, and he's still walking at age 61, so he has a very mild phenotype. We based our microdystrophin designs off the components that this patient actually has retained, and has subsequently have tested them in a series of animal experiments until we came up with our construct for SRP9001, which is the figure on the right. This construct retains many of the important elements of natural normal dystrophin and is what we're testing in our current clinical studies and we'll be testing in our development plan. Going on to our development plan, so we're gonna discuss this in a bit more detail in the subsequent slides. And again, I just wanna remind everyone that microdystrophin is investigational, has not been reviewed or approved by the FDA or any uh, regulatory authorities. Our development plan is designed to answer a series of questions that will hopefully determine if SRP9001 works and has positive benefits with minimal risks. This slide summarizes the questions we want to answer. It should be questions that are asked of any gene therapy for DMD. First, what is the safety and tolerability of gene therapy? Second, does the transgene enter muscle cells? And if so, how much is there in the cells? Third, is the transgene delivered to muscle cells? Was it able to instruct the cells to make the desired protein? Fourth, is the protein, uh, if the protein is made, is it getting to the right place in the cell to do its job? And if so, how much is there in that location? And finally, on the right side of the slide, number five, what is the in clinical impact and what functional data do we have? I'll go over the specific tests and tools we use for SRP9001 to answer these questions, but first start with the last item, the functional assessments. For functional assessments, one of the tools we used is the North Star Ambulatory Assessment, or NSAA score. This assessment measures motor function in individuals with Duchenne's who are ambulatory. The NSA consists of 17 individual assessments that a patient is asked to perform, it takes about 20 minutes to conduct, and is a good tool to monitor changes over time. It's something that many research centers can do, and they can do it consistently and in a reproducible way. Each assessment is given a score of zero, one, or two, where the higher score to the maximum score of 34, meaning that the patient uh, has better functional performance. 
Now, NSA is not the only functional measure that can be used to measure the impact of gene therapy or other therapies in DMD. Uh, we're also using other tests, such as time function tests, and other non surreptive studies use additional assessments, including pulmonary functions, et cetera. In our first in human study, the trial one, this study is an open label trial involving four boys with DMD. These boys were aged four, four, five, and six years at the time of their dosing in this study. Open label means that each of these boys received SRP9001 and there was no placebo comparator or control group. The primary endpoint of this study was safety. Secondary endpoints include changes in microdystrophin expression, both pre and post infusion with SRP9001, decreases in CK or creatinine kinase, the 100 meter time function test, changes in the NSA score that we discussed previously, and assessments of, immuni and assessments of immunity uh, to AAV. As you can see in this slide, all four boys were on a stable dose of steroids prior to study entry. Just before and after infusion, the steroids were adjusted so that each received a minimum daily dose equivalent to one milligram per kilogram of prednisone for at least 30 days. Now I'll share with you what we learned from this study so far. First, what are the safety and tolerability data? In these four boys, we do not have any serious adverse events. The most common adverse event was vomiting that was seen in two of the boys shortly after SRP9001 infusion. This event was not associated with any other abnormalities in the boys and resolved without intervention. Three of the four boys also had an increase in gamma GT, which is a limer enzyme that all resolved within a week following an adjustment to their steroid dose. We did not see any clinical sequelae that are associated with either an immune response to the transgene or related to complement activation. Apart from the gamma and GT, we did not see any other clinically significant laboratory findings. The next question we wanted to answer was, did our microdystrophin transgene get into the muscle cells? In this study, we measured how many copies of our microdystrophin transgene was dissected in muscle cells by looking at muscle biopsy samples that we took prior to the infusion or at baseline in 90 days or approximately 12 weeks after the infusion. From these samples, we found that we had an average of 3.3 copies of our transgene per muscle cell nucleus, the part of the cell where we want this transgene to be. This means that we had greater than 100,000 vector copies per microgram of DNA material detected. The next question is what, um, the next question is, was the microdystrophin protein that the transgene codes for present within the muscle cells? And if so, how much is there? We use the Western blot technique, something that we've also used for our PMO and PPMO programs uh, to detect this. This, this slide shows the results of that testing. What we see is that the microdystrophin protein was detected after infusion in all four boys as indicated by the boxed bands on the right side of the figure in the above slide. So if you look at the three figures, you'll see a small box that tra translates a bar, a line, and that's the microdystrophin. What we did not see was that the microdystrophin or these bands uh, present before the infusion. So they were only present after the transgene was delivered. When we quantified this against a normal control group, which is a group of normal people who have intact normal dystrophin, the mean microdystrophin versus the normal was 74.3%, utilizing a Sarepta quantification method that did not adjust for fat or fibrotic tissue. Using a nationwide quantification method that did adjust for fat or fibrotic tissue, the mean microdystrophin value versus normal was 95.8%. Next, we wanted to see if the protein is at the right place within the cell. In this case, it is at the cell membrane, and if so, how much is there? This slide shows images in which we use an immunofluorescent antibody that binds to muscle complex proteins that bind with either dystrophin or microdystrophin to see where our transgene protein, the microdystrophin, goes. The results again are based on the biopsy we did before and after infusion without the SRP9001. The before infusion images are on the top and the after infusion images are on the bottom. On the far left is the image of a normal control. 
The red color represents dystrophin or microdystrophin. In this slide, what you see is in the top row in the, is in the, the pre-infusion muscle biopsies, you do not see either dystrophin or microdystrophin, or you see very little of it. In the bottom row, after infusion in muscle biopsies done 90 days later, you see a clear increase in the red staining represent micro, representing microdystrophin expression in presence of that protein in the cells after treatment. You also see that this protein is located at the sarcolemma, so it's an outline on the outside of the muscle fiber, which is a cell membrane, and this is the place that we need it to be in order to be functional. Compared to the baseline or pre-infusion values, the mean percent of muscle fibers expressing microdystrophin was 81.2%, with the mean intensity of 96% after infusion. Finally, are there clinical functional improvements after treatment? This slide summarizes the results of changes in the NSAA score. In all four boys, we saw an increase in NSAA with an average increase of 5.5 points at one year, or 27% improvement from baseline. The results that we discussed in the previous slides are all being assessed in our current placebo control study and will be studied in upcoming studies as highlighted in our clinical development plan. This is an overview of our development plan. As we just discussed, trial one was first conducted, was the first study that we conducted at Nationwide and involved four patients. The goals of this study was safety and proof of concept, which we achieved. Dosing is complete in this study, and the one-year data was presented, as I mentioned previously, just last week. Trial two is our ongoing placebo control study involving 41 patients, and this one is taking place at Nationwide and at UCLA. The goal of this study includes safety and functional assessments. Enrollment in the study is now complete, and the crossover dosing of the first group of patients that have actually finished the first part of the study is now ongoing, so all patients in part two of the study will receive active therapy. Please note that the, please note the data from this study will be released when the study is completed, as is typical for studies that are placebo-controlled. We know there is much interest in the future gene therapy studies that we're planning. As we previously stated, our goal is to expand the eligibility criteria across different late-stage studies. The first late-stage study is slated to begin in the second half of this year, 2020. It will look similar to the previous study, Studies 2, and will use commercial process material. We have not finalized the specific details on the eligibility criteria for this trial, this trial three, or the sites in the countries that will be involved. We're also working on finishing the designs of other late stage studies and we'll update the community when we have more information to share. These late stage studies will support global regulatory filings as well as access and reimbursement across the spectrum of DMD. Your thoughts, comments, and feedback help make our work better. At last year's PPMD conference, we had wonderful interactions with you at our advocacy booth, including our suggestion box. While we can't be together in person this year, please feel free to connect with us with your comments and questions. So to speak with a member of the Patients Affairs team, email us at advocacy at sarepta.com and we'll follow up with you. Once again, thank you to all the patients, their families, care caregiver, and study staff who have participated in our clinical trials and who make this all possible. And thank you for your time today. Have a nice day. Thank you.